So uh, you all ready to get in the Word of God this morning? We're going to finish out our series, God's Word, The Better Story. And uh, I hope that you've enjoyed it. I hope that it's been helpful to you. I hope that it's gr- helped stretch your faith and, uh, and that you've grown closer to the Lord. And for the final sermon, we're going to use the title, The Walk. And uh, The Walk was a movie a few years back that came out about a Frenchman who his desire was he wanted to be known as, as someone that did this, these high-wire uh, feats. And uh, he was a tightrope walker and then his dream was to do something just to kind of stand out and uh, so when the twin towers were being built in america he came over to the united states and he met some people and coerced some people and built some relationships and and talked them into helping him pull off a feat of stretching a rope across uh, the north and south towers and for him to walk over so the whole story is building up to this the walk, this this walk that he's going to take. And, and so in August the 7th, 1974, he, uh, he stretches the rope uh, across the unfinished towers and he walks across them. Thus, the walk. And, uh, and so that's Hollywood's uh, spin on a... Uh, on a, based on a true story of millions of dollars going in to talking about the walk. And though that was an impressive walk and that would have been an exciting to see, uh, there I, I believe there's a greater walk than that. And I think God's Word has the better story. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So if you would, stand with me for the honor of reading God's Word as we open up in Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, we'll start with verse 19. Luke 16 Verse 19. It says, There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades... Being in torment, he lifted up his eyes, and he saw Abraham far off, and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. He said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Let us pray. Father, as we look at your word and we hear from you, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, would you settle our hearts and minds right now? Would you take away the distractions Take away the busyness of the day's agenda, Lord, and I pray that you would allow each person to have a moment of pause within this hour that we would uh, reflect and understand where we stand. Lord, our prayer is that everyone who is in the room today, that they would be like Lazarus when they die and they would be with you forever in heaven. And Father, if there's anyone who's on the path of the rich man, that you would speak to their heart and that you would bring them from death to life and that you would speak salvation into them. I'm going to preach plain and clear today. I understand the judgment on my life and rightly dividing your word of truth, and I do accept that place. For it's in Jesus' name I pray and his name I preach. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We're going to be talking about a little bit here at the front end of the message, a topic that a lot of people don't like to talk about, a lot of churches don't like to talk about, a lot of Christians don't like to talk about. It makes us nervous. It makes us uneasy. It makes uh, God sometimes seem 
harsh, and, and that is the reality of hell. In this story, if you have a study Bible or you look up this story in commentary, many people believe this to be a parable. I'm not quite convinced that it is a parable, uh, but regardless, it is speaking of an eternal truth that we need to understand today. That there is a consequence in our life for rejecting God's ways. And that once we die, there is an eternal state that is set and is fixed. There is a reality of heaven and there is a reality of hell. Whether we like to talk about that or think about that or not. And once a person dies, their soul is, is, their, their uh, fate is sealed. And there are no second third, fourth chances. We see in this story two men that die. One goes to heaven, one goes to Hades. And in Hades, he is in torment. It is not a good place. It's not a place where we just kind of joke about them. Many people, when they speak about hell, they, they kind of put it off and they kind of joke about it like, well, if I go to hell, you know, I'm going to go down there with a lot of my buddies. <laughs> We're going to have a good old time, you know. That's wrong. It's going to be a place of torment. It's going to be a place of God's eternal judgment upon their life. It's going to be a place of anguish, grief, despair. He is in so much torment, he is begging for just a drip of water from the finger of Lazarus. It's final, it's fixed. There is no more redemption. There is no more hope for salvation. A great chasm has been fixed to where those who are in hell cannot go to heaven. Those who are in heaven cannot go to hell. In hell you can look up and can see the glories of heaven and the splendors and the joys and the comfort that they receive there. And you can only be tortured by the thoughts that forever you will be in torment here. It's a place so bad and so horrendous that those who are there, they don't want their loved ones to go there. Notice what he said. He said, I've got five brothers. Can you send Lazarus to go and speak to them and tell them that they don't want to end up in this place? Now notice that the rich man is still unrepentant. He still lives out in his prideful way of living. He, he, is, uh, he has been rich his whole life. And it, he wasn't in hell because he was rich. He was in hell because he did not submit to the ways of God and live under his authority. How many times did he walk over Lazarus day after day and just kind of discredit him? And he's still in hell trying to boss Lazarus around saying, hey, can you send Lazarus to give me a, a drink of water, just a, tip, a, a drip of water? Hey, can you send Lazarus to go and tell? And Abraham says, they have Moses and the prophets. If they're not going to listen to Moses and the prophets, they're not going to listen to anybody. Yet. No, no, but no, if they, if they see somebody from the dead come back and speak to them, then they'll believe. And he says, no, if they do not believe Moses and the prophets, they will not, they'll not even believe someone if they come back from the dead. This is also a prophetic statement by Jesus, letting the Pharisees and the Sadducees know that, hey, even when I rise from the dead, there's going to be many who do not believe. He said, but no, if someone would just come and visit them, then they would believe. And many times we play this game, and, and a lot of folks have, have played this game with God. And maybe you have even said stuff like this. You've doubted, you've wondered, is God really real? Does he really speak? Is he really present? And you'll say, Lord, if you'll just show me a sign. If you'll just speak to me in a dream, or you'll speak to me in a vision, or if you'll just... I tell you what, I'm praying for this, and if it will just go the way that I want it to go, then I'll know you're real. I know you're real. And I would say to you this morning what Abraham said to the rich man, no, you won't. No, you won't. Even if God would come to you in a dream or a vision, you still wouldn't believe. You still would shake it off. You still rationalize it away, because if you will not believe the word of God, you're not going to believe it. 
We have been given God's word and he speaks and he reveals and he tells us everything that we need to know to know him and to live for him. And if we will not believe the word of God, we're not going to believe even if somebody comes back from the dead and would speak to us. Even if we saw a vision, if we saw a dream, we wouldn't believe it if we won't believe his word. And so this morning, we got to ask this question. If I were to die today, if this would be the last moment that I, I breathe my last breath, where would I spend eternity? Because here's the truth. God didn't create hell for us. It wasn't meant for us to spend eternity as separated from God. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, he created man in his image. Male and female, he made them. In the image of God, he created them. And we were to reflect the glory of God. We were to be his image bearers. And he loved his creation so much, he said, it is very good. And he created, uh, he placed them in the Garden of Eden. And they were in, in perfect paradise where they had a walk with God. And they had all of their needs met. They had everything they wanted. And he said, all of the seed-bearing fruit, you can have to eat. There's two trees. There's the tree of life and then the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You can eat of any of those trees, but just the one, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Do not eat from that. In that, when you eat of that, you will die. And Adam and Eve had all the luxuries of living and walking in the presence of God and living in peace where there is no sin and sickness and disease and all the chaos that we now see in life. And, and the two trees... Instead of eating from the tree of life, guess which one they chose? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life represents the, the life built on trust, that you can trust and you find your life in God, that you are dependent on God. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, a life that is independent of God. I don't need God to tell me what is right or wrong. I can decide for myself. I don't need him. I can make those decisions on my own. And when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, sin entered the world. I'm going to use this whiteboard. I'm going to show you some things that you can use as you talk to maybe a friend or someone over at lunch. It's called the bridge illustration as we talk about God. And you might want to write this down as an example and keep this as you work because what we are told in the Bible is that God is... Okay, God has always existed, and he is a loving God. God is love, and he created man. But what happened is, when Adam and Eve sinned, and when Adam and Eve rebelled, we all are descendants of Adam and Eve. And so what that means is this, everyone that's born, we are born under uh, the flesh of Adam and Eve. And when we sin, we sin because we are sinners by nature and we're also sinners by choice. And the Bible says in Isaiah 59, 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. So when Adam and Eve sinned, when we sin, it causes a separation. What was meant to be connected has now been disconnected. What was meant to be together is now separated. And sin separates man from God. And so we live in Genesis 3 and following where man is opposed to God and separated from him. Romans 3.10 says this. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. This is a quote from Psalm 114 where it says, God looks down from heaven on the, on the children of men and he's seeking anyone who might search after him or seek after him. And what he discovers is that there is none who does right. There is none who does good. There is none who seeks him. They are all turned away. There is none righteous, no, not 
1, Romans 3, 23, says, For all have what? And fall short of the glory of God. Does it say, for some have sinned? All. Does it say, everyone but me has sinned? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, the first part of that verse says, For the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin is death. Why? Because God, being a loving God, is a just God. So he requires justice. Our sin separates us from God. Our sin is a violation of God's command, and that requires justice, which results in death. For the wages of sin, the payment of sin, the payment for rebellion against God is death. So, here's what we do. We try to figure out ways to get to God, right? So we try to figure out how we can bridge the chasm, how we can go from here to here. And so we'll, we'll try our own ladders, and we'll try religion. Religion. And we'll say, well, I need to be religious, and so we'll try to be religious, and we'll, we'll pick a religion, and in our day and age, as it has been in all cultures, it doesn't really matter what you believe. Just pick one as long as you are, what? Sincere. Just pick a religion. Just pick a faith. And as long as you're sincere, that's all you need. Because sincerity is what it's all about. So I can be a Buddhist. I can be a Hindu. I can be a, I can. Uh, worship Allah, it doesn't matter. As long as I'm sincere in my faith, then, then that's going to get me back to God. And that is a lie. That is false. That is not true. Because sincerity is not what saves you. How many of you all have ever been sincere about something, but sincerely wrong? Huh? Been sincerely wrong? I mean, I could be sincere. I could believe that I could fly. Right? You can sing that song that was popular way back. I believe I can fly. And touch the sky, right? Yeah. And I could sincerely believe that. And I could believe that with my whole being. And I could jump off a building. And guess what? I'm going to be sincerely dead. I'm not going to be flying. Why? Because it's not true that I can fly. So it doesn't matter how sincere you are. What matters is the object of your faith. It must be true. If the object of your sincerity is not true, it doesn't matter how sincere you are. If it's wrong, it's wrong. So it doesn't matter how sincere you believe in a God. If it's a false God, it's a false God. It's not true. And so the scripture says there is only one God. He is the Lord of heaven. He reigns on high. So any other faith or belief, as sincere as you are and as devout as you are, it is not going to get you to God. So some of us will try, well, good works. That ought to do it. I'll work real hard. And I'll, I'll have a lot of good works, and I'll try, to be, I'll try to be the best person I can be. So, you know, I may, um, I may get into social work, do a lot of good stuff for people and help people. Uh, I may go get an education, because that's what, um, if I can just, the education is, the, is, is power, and that's what's going to, you know, if we can just, you know, our intellect can get us to God. Or, um, this is real popular now, I'll be an activist. And I'll get on a cause, and I'll make my movement known, and I'll change the world by my, my passion. Well, the problem with our good works is Ephesians chapter 2, 
verses 8 and 9. Where the Bible says this, For by grace are you saved through faith. And this is what? Not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not as a result of works so that no one may boast. So you're not going to work your way to heaven. Well, then a lot of people, they just, they just believe this. They think this is the one that's going to get them there. Well, I'm really a good person. And because I'm a good person and God's a good God, then obviously I'm going to go to heaven. And, and some will do this. I know so-and-so who goes to church. And they say they're going to heaven. And I know I live better than they do. So if they're going to heaven, then I must be going to heaven. True? Don't people think that way? Well, my question is, how do you know that person's going to heaven? Just because they say they're going to heaven doesn't mean they're going to heaven. If you're a good person, compared to who? Hitler? Yeah, I'm I'm good. I compare myself to Hitler. Man, I'm I'm way up there. I'm right close to almost getting to God. Billy Graham? Got to go back down a little bit, right? Compared to who? How, how are you going to figure out if you're a good person or not? I tell you what, let's take a test. You ready to take a test? Pop quiz. Y'all ready for a pop quiz? It's only ten questions. God gave us ten commandments, right? If you are a good person, can you be perfect? Perfection. If you can be perfect, can you be perfect? Even as you're, if you're really good, it, you fall short. Let's say you're the best that you can be. You're still not going to get there. Let's, let's prove it. You ready? We won't go through all ten. We'll just get ourselves to an F. You ready? Here we go. Number one. Have you ever lied? How many of you raised your hand if you've ever lied? Okay, if you didn't raise your hand, you just lied. Now you can raise it. <laughs> all right, so we're down to a B. Have you ever stolen anything? Anybody ever stolen anything? Let me ask it this way. Have you ever cheated on a test and stolen someone else's answer on an exam? Okay. Some of you are saying, I already admitted I'm a liar. I'm going to ride this out. <laughs> Have you committed adultery? Jesus has said, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, if you look with somebody else with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. And we're down to C now. <laughs> How many of you all have disobeyed your parents or talked back to your parents and not respected and loved and honored your parents? Now we're down to a D. How many of you all have ever loved someone or something more than God and you've put something else before God? F. We all flunked. We all failed. And so we're all not, we're we're not perfect, we just admit we're not perfect. And when I'm talking to somebody that's sports minded, I'll I'll say it like this. None of us have batted a thousand. If you wanted to get back to God, you'd have to be perfect. And in baseball, as soon as you strike out one time, as soon as you hit a ground out and you ground out one time, you pop out one time, you get yourself into a fielder's choice, the moment you do that, you will never bat a 1,000 that season. It is over. It doesn't matter if you get a hit the rest of the season. You will never have a 1,000 batting average. You'll never be perfect. You can't be perfect. And what some of us tend to think is this. Well, since we're all not perfect, we're all sinners, God's going to just let us all get by and he's going to grade on some type of curve and he's going to let us all pass. No, that's not true because God is a God of love. He is a God of justice. Somebody has to pay for the crime. Somebody has to pay for the sin. 
If God didn't require justice, he would not be a loving God. Take a judge, for instance, a human secular judge. If someone brutally murdered someone in your family, say your wife or, or children, and you knew who that was, and that person was caught, and that person admittedly said, I'm the one that did it. And you go to the day of court, and his day of sentencing comes, and the judge says, you know, well, since I'm a, uh, a judge of love, I'm just going to let you go. I'm just going to let you off. How would you feel as that family member? Would you feel that that was loving? Absolutely not. There must be justice in order for that judge to be a just and loving judge. Someone has to pay for the sin. And so the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But here is the good news. It's called John 3, 16. We all know that one, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have what? everlasting life. You know what? Jesus came to do something about our sin problem. God the Father sent God the Son so that he might take care of our sin problem. He had the walk that we couldn't live. He lived the life that we couldn't live. He died the death that we should have died so that we might have an opportunity for forgiveness because not only is God, he is love, so that, that means he has to be just, so he has to execute justice, but he also is a God of mercy. He's also a God of mercy. And the mercy of God is shown through Jesus Christ who came. And he lived all the commandments. He fulfilled all the commandments. He lived the law perfectly. He submitted to the Father's will. Whatever the Father said to do, that's what he did. Whatever he said, see, uh, saw the Father doing, that's what he did. He's, he, he followed Jesus completely and he lived the perfect sinless life. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians... 521, read this, for our sake he made him, this is talking about God the Father made God the Son, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. So what happened is God the Father sent God the Son to become sin. He bore our sin. He never sinned. He didn't sin, but he bore our sin. He became sin on our behalf so that everything that we have done, every sin that we've committed, he took upon himself and he experienced the wrath and the justice and the payment of, from God the Father for our sin. So he paid the penalty. So he had the greatest walk that you could ever imagine. He stretched from death to life. That's much further than the Twin Towers, wasn't it? He bridged the, the chasm. He put a rope across hell and heaven and said, I can do it. I can walk that walk. I can redeem and I can save. And through the cross, there is possibility for salvation. John chapter 5, verse 24. John 5, 24. This is Jesus speaking. Now notice what he says. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has what? He who does not come, he does not come into judgment, but has passed from what? Death to life. Now notice there's two parts to this, right? He who hears my words. He who hears my words. That's only part of it. Just hearing the gospel is not going to take you to heaven. Just hearing the good news, just hearing about salvation doesn't make you a believer. Just being in church doesn't make you a Christian. Just coming to church every Sunday and hearing the message of the gospel is not enough to get you to heaven. He who hears my words and what? Believes. 
He who hears my words and believes will cross from death to life. That's the good news. That's the good news that we don't have to spend eternity separated from God. God loved us so much that he did something about it. He allowed his son to take the punishment that I deserved. He didn't deserve to die. I did. But he stood in my place and said, Father, I will take their sentence. I will carry out their sentence. I will die so that they can live. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is what? And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you might be saved. Is that what it says? It says you will be saved. That's an emphatic you will be saved. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't say you might be saved, could be saved, should be saved. When John writes his letter to the church in 1 John, he says, I write these things to you, dear children, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Not hope you have eternal life. Not that you think you have eternal life, but that you know you have eternal life. Let me ask you this question. If you were to die today, do you know for certain that heaven would be your home? I, I, I don't want you to say, well, boy, I hope I would, Grant. I mean, I think I would. I want you to know. I want you to know. How can you know? And some of you that are even Christians, sometimes you doubt. Am I really saved? And usually those moments of doubt come in moments of disobedience because sin will cause us to doubt. But here's how you could know. Let me ask you this question. Are you trusting anything other than the finished work of Christ to save you from your sin? Is it Jesus plus something else? Or is, I honestly believe that when Jesus died on the cross, he paid the penalty for my sin. And I just don't believe it with my mind. I receive it with my heart and I ask him to be Lord of my life. And I have asked him to come into me and save me and change me from the inside out. Have I called upon his name for salvation? And that alone. And when I do that, guess what? He will change my heart. Works does not save us, but saving faith produces works. So as a child of God, if I have completely trusted in the finished work of Christ to pay the penalty for my sin, and he has converted me and changed me from the inside out, he has now placed in me a new heart, so now I have new passions and new desires. And I can tell if I'm a Christian this way, that I'm Trusting completely in the finished work of Christ and then the things that he loves, I love. The things that he hates, I hate. And yes, God hates some things. God hates sin. And so when I love the things that God loves and I hate the things that God hates, that's evidence that I've been born again or born anew, that I have been converted and I have the Holy Spirit of God living in me, and that I don't revel in my sin, that I'm not proud of my sin, that I don't throw a parade for my sin, know that I repent and turn from my sin. Because without it, when we die, heaven will not be our home. There was two guys in the story. There was the rich man and there was Lazarus. Lazarus went to be in the comfort of the grace and mercy of God for all eternity. And the other one was in torment and flames. Your life and your eternity, your soul, is the most important thing 
most important decision, most important that, that, than anything. That's why the Bible says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, for today is the day of salvation. Because you're not promised tomorrow. You're not promised next week. And so if you don't have certainty today, you're like, Grant, man, I need to be saved, and I, I want to go to heaven. Then during this invitation time, I'm going to ask you to come, and, and let's pray. Let's ask you, let's confess with our mouth and believe with our heart today that Jesus is Lord, that God raised him from the dead. And let's go from death to life. You don't have to die in your sin. So you've heard it. You've heard it. Now it's time to believe it and receive it. And this morning, if you've never received the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done, I am begging you this morning, I'm pleading with you to come and receive the mercy of God. I don't want anyone here to spend eternity in hell separated from God. God's made it possible for you. Will you trust Him? Let's pray. Father.